This is the largest genus in the orchid family and one of the largest genera of flowering plants with more than 2,000 species, exceeded in number only by Atragalus. So when you look at the four bulbophyllums that I have, it is totally understandable that you may think I cannot speak on this genus, their care requirements and all that fun stuff. Well, even though my collection is not extensive, the information following the intro is concise and you will not be disappointed should you watch the video to the end. And because I only have four boba films, I took a personal deep dive to bring you the information in this video and I would really appreciate it if you would like the video already and subscribe so as not to miss out on more videos like this and many others to come. With a 9 second intro coming up, this would be a great time to do both. Thank you so much for still being here. I appreciate that you are, and we will get into how to care for bulba films just now, but first of all, thank you Miss Behaves Class for this request. I hope that this will not just be your one-stop shop video for when it comes to this fabulous genus, but that if shared around to other contacts like orchid societies or forums, that many will find this video useful as well. Next thing I need to point out is, as per these kinds of videos, I have care cards for bulba films, which are not difficult to source. The bulbas that I have picked for the care cards range from dwarf size to large, from compact rhizomes to creeping rhizomes, in the hopes that I have covered a broad selection of bulbas for many different grow spaces, setups, and climates. In addition to that, each care card has a stamp on it, one being easy, the other being expert, while every orchid is easy to grow if the requirements are met. When it comes to bulbos, the expert stamp is only there to create awareness of details that really need to be met in order to grow the species successfully, especially when it comes to cold temperatures coupled with high humidity. So that is the perspective of where I used expert to create awareness, as in, have a closer look at what is needed for that specific species. For the duration of this video, the care cards and corresponding characteristics will pop up in alphabetical orders for the bulbos I have looked into. So what I would like to do now is to cover the general care for the bulba films because if there is a genus out there that general care applies, bulba films fall into that category, with the exception for some that require lower temperatures and will not survive in warm temperatures, after which I will end the video with a closer look at my four, because once we get to that point, you will wonder how I'm able to grow these bulbos in a climate that does not have anything near the humidity requirements for growing bulbo films successfully. Perhaps as you go through the video, you may be thinking to yourself, yeah, I can't grow them, I have no humidity. Well, if that is the case, neither do I, but here we are. With the exception of one of my bulbos, I have managed to bloom all of them. So if that is of interest to you, that segment will come after general care. Meanwhile, timestamps are in the description for your convenience. Having gotten all of that housekeeping out of the way, have your fingers at the ready to ask any questions you may have throughout the video. There may be some things that you question, want me to elaborate on, and thankfully we have the comments section for further discussions. So let's start with humidity. If nothing else, bulba films need their humidity all the time, no matter the temperature range. 90% of the care cards have a humidity requirement equal to 75% or higher. This humidity level is the safest and surest level for successful bulba film growing. While some bulbos may be tolerant of lower levels, that would then go hand in hand with a setup and or watering, misting, however the bulbos survive in different environments, but to be on the safe side as in general, 75% and higher consistently will guarantee happy and vigorous bulba films. However, with such high humidity levels all year round, there is a fundamental and important element that cannot be cut out, which is airflow. The reason such humidity levels are sustainable and loved by bulbos is because of the constant airflow that they are exposed to, no matter what elevation they are native to. You have to have airflow to avoid any rot from kicking in, but at the same time, the airflow should not cancel out the humidity. If you do not have these conditions for 80% of the year dialed in, then some of the species will not do well in your climate, or you have to change the setup or you're going to have to water or mist your bulbos 
a lot for certain months of the year. While it can be done, especially if bulbas are mounted, which is what they love the most, because every part of their structures is exposed to airflow, it can get overwhelming and also upsetting when you're not able to keep up and see your bulba struggling. Take it from me, I know, and that is why I want to make sure that there is no having one element as in humidity in place without the other one being airflow in place. Pretty much, having these two elements in place one could go so far as to say that watering is not even necessary because of all the moisture in the air that the bulba roots are super effective at absorbing. But that would be pushing our luck, seeing as we are simulating what bulbos have in their natural habitat. And in their natural habitat, it can rain a lot for an extensive period of time during which they are getting nutrients from whatever structure they have attached themselves to. So, while humidity and airflow will considerably reduce your workload in bulbo care, watering them is still of utmost importance because having the humidity and airflow dialed in, bulbos are vigorous. There are very few winter resters, most of them are continuous growers because for the most part, the temperatures are steady all year round. However, they start their active growth when they get inundated with tropical rain showers during the rainy seasons of their natural habitat. So, new growths being tender are exposed to these high moisture levels even after the rain has stopped and yet they will not rot out because of constant airflow. Watering depends on your setup, on your humidity levels and temperatures. Either way, when in active growth, bulbos want more water than what they would pull from the air and because of where the bulbos come from, the humidity is so high, their substrate should never dry out completely if grown in a pot, even during the cooler months of the year. While my care cards state, winter slightly dry, the emphasis on this statement is slightly. They do not like their substrate to go dry. If you have the bulbo on a mount, then it will be the humidity that tides them over and watering can be reduced. But if your humidity drops because your heaters are on, then the surrounding air may get drier, dropping the humidity level, and you need to counteract that with watering. So, rule of thumb, abundant watering during the growing season and never let the media dry out completely if your bulbo is in a pot. Now, speaking of heaters, let's seg into temperatures. With such a massive genus spread out worldwide, there is a general consensus that bulbos are going to be fine if they are grown in temperatures between 15 degrees Celsius and 30 degrees Celsius. My care cards are a little bit more targeted depending on the species in question, but this temperature range is safe for 80% of bulbos out there. However, again, there is one cool to cold growing species in the care cards that will not make it if exposed to higher temperatures than 15 degrees Celsius, so keep that in mind. Not all bulbos are intermediate, warm or hot growers, and here is where elevation comes in. For that reason, I have created an additional visual that compares how temperatures drop based on elevations. Bulbos can be found growing from sea level up to 3000 meters above sea level, which is super important to get an understanding of. Seeing as many times we check which bulbo we can take care of, we see elevations and then maybe we are told the bulbo is an intermediate to warm grower, but temperatures are not defined. I am hoping that this visual will help provide an understanding when it comes to elevations and temperature comparisons. And if that is the case, feel free to take a screenshot for future reference. We have already had this care card for Bulbophyllum show up, but I'm going to use that as an example here because you will find a lot of bulbos growing in and around the equator. So the research will show the country. We see it as being by the equator and then we assume in and around the equator and then we assume tropical and it has to be a warm grower. But there are elevations in and around the equator and Bulbophyllum alticola is found at elevations around 2,400 meters up to 3,100 meters and up there it gets really really cold. <laughs> I have climbed Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania which is bang smack on the equator. It is 5,895 meters and well the air is thin and cold at 3,100 meters where Bulbophyllum alticola is happiest at and many more similar to that one but for the sake of the video I only threw in one species that likes it that cold and humid all the time and the reason it does well in those conditions once again is because of airflow. 
With all those factors dialed in, we are still needing to add some fertilizer to sustain the vigor that is in this genus. However, bulbophyllums have fine roots that grow every which way but loose. <laughs> They will not always attach to a mount or grow into a pot because of their growth habit when it comes to creeping rhizomes. For that reason, I have added very conservative amounts of fertilizer for each care card. Because when it comes to seeing how your bulbs perform in your environment and setup, you can always up the quantity of fertilizer and test them out with supplements. But my recommendations are there to ensure there will be no salt accumulation around the roots resulting in root burn. While bulbos are happy root growers, they need to be because of what they do out in nature with them, absorbing nutrients and water from the surrounding air, the roots are so delicate and do not support any kind of buildup around them. Where they come from, the air is pure and clean, and with that in mind, that is how we need to approach growing bulbophyllums. Pure and clean roots all the time, and to achieve that while also making sure that we support their vigor, less is more, seeing as the media never should dry out, as well as mounts are exposed to high humidity, fertilizing at lower levels at every watering is the safest way to go, and then flushing is super important as well, which can be done 30 minutes after watering just to clean the roots, the media and mount from any residual fertilizer or supplement that was not absorbed, especially in an environment that does not have the steady high humidity, flushing will help in avoiding any possible root burn. It is the growth habit of the bulbophyllums that exposes roots to the air and without humidity these will dry out super fast. Because a lot of bulbophyllums have a creeping rhizome and while we have a bulba on a mount it does not mean that the next new growth will acknowledge the mount and grow along it. Instead, the new growth will meander towards the direction of light, which could be from the front of the mount or above it, and hey presto, you have yourself a long rhizome with roots growing out from the bulb that is forming, but they are exposed to the air and will not reach the mount to attach itself to. Pinning the new growth to where it would work best on a mount is ideal, but be careful because the rhizomes are tender as they grow. They snap easily, and when they are hardened off to the point that bending them towards the mount is possible, the roots are already underway and breaking those is easily done as well. Also, there is a high risk of cracking the now woody rhizome. And that is why humidity and misting is fundamental if the rhizome couldn't be manipulated to bring it towards the mount or back into the media because those roots are going to be aerial. Needless to say, having described that, bulbos are also somewhat of an adventure to attempt to contain in a pot it can be a bit frustrating if your climate does not help you out with humidity. This may all sound very cumbersome, so why bother? But there are a lot of bulbs that are miniature and some of those will have a compact growing habit which makes them conducive to growing in pots. The care cards specify those characteristics as well, so if you are looking to grow bulbos, you know you may struggle to keep them happy because of humidity levels being lower, and you can already say that you would have to have them grow in pots, then look for bulbos that have a compact growing habit. This way you will not have a species on your hand that is adventurous and insists on investigating who is doing what in the neighboring pot or mount. I briefly touched on the roots breaking, so I just want to elaborate on that. Bulbos do not like their roots messed with. They are picky about that, so if you have to repot or do any kind of intervention with your bulbo, do it when you see a new growth start growing new roots. And then do it quickly, because once again, bulbos are happy root growers and they will grow relatively quickly. While with other orchids, we have a window of opportunity to repot because the root growth is a little bit slower. This is not the case with bulbophyllums. And do not do anything with your bulba when you see a new growth starting, assuming that new roots are on the way. Now you think you can repot or remount because it takes a few months for the new growth to actually start growing a new bulb. What you see as a new growth starting is in actual fact the early stages of the rhizome from which a new bulb will form. But depending on the bulbo in question, the rhizome has a long way to go before it forms a bulb. And intervening before you see a bulb forming will probably cause issues with the existing root system from which the orchid is actually drawing from 
to create the new growth or growths. This does not apply to such a strict degree with compact growing bulbos, but even miniature bulbos can have a creeping rhizome, so keep that in mind in your planning on dealing with bulbos in pots or mounts. A new growth does not equate to good timing for repotting. That rhizome has as yet to develop. With bulbos, when you see the bulbs starting to form and roots starting to grow, then the length of the rhizome has already been determined and then you can repot. But we still have to address the light requirements and well, the care cards are pretty repetitive for all the species I have chosen for this video. Bright shade for all of them. That is my safest recommendation for all bulba films. Some care guides will say this bulba can take cattleya light but it does not say where the grower is growing the bulbo. And every time we say cattleya light, we think the orchid can tolerate direct sun. Your bulbo will not appreciate direct sun no matter where you are. We can discuss morning or late afternoon sun in specific environments in the comments, but your safest bet for vigorous and blooming guaranteed bulbos is the brightest shade that you can give it without exposing it to direct sun. Meanwhile, once again, take note of the locations of the habitats being close to the equator. Bulbos are predominantly found in Asia, Latin America, the West Indies, various islands in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. So your bulbo film will always have 12 hours of light, no matter the elevation. Taking all these requirements into consideration, assuming we have them dialed in, unfortunately, bulbo films are not disease free. The common bulbophyllum diseases include bacterial soft spot, fungal crown rot, and bacterial brown spot. Bacterial brown spot, also known as Irvinia, looks like a wet spot on the leaf of the plant. The leaf will smell bad and the infected area will increase in size over a matter of days. Fungal crown rots are also very common among bulbos. It starts as a discoloration on the surface of the leaves and stems, which can ultimately kill the plant if not taken care of. These fungi mostly target overwatered, excessively moist plants living in colder temperatures. And with that in mind, the bulbos in the care cards classified as expert gives a heads up to them coping or liking low temperatures, but it comes with risks in cultivation that you need to take into consideration and be mindful of. Last but not least, bacterial brown spot is similar to bacterial soft spot. The leaf turns brown and expands over days until it eventually starts smelling bad and secretes a dark liquid. Just keep the airflow consistent when growing bulbophyllums that love their high humidity and the majority of these issues will not be a problem. But when it comes to what pests would be attracted to bulbos, I am just going to say every single pest that loves humidity, no matter if the temperature requirements are high or slightly lower. While bulbos have fleshy leaves, the cuticles are not tough to create a barrier for pests and they are happy sap producers when watered in a pot and misting is not a regular watering regime which would wash excess happy sap off. So, a bolo out there for all bulbos and potential for pests. Thankfully, mine have not shown any infestations in the years I've had them, which could be because of my extreme low humidity. We've already covered quite a lot, but there is always the elephant in the room when it comes to bulbophyllum. That is a question that I see many people ask when they see a bulbophyllum bloom and are amazed by the coloration and details the structure of the bloom shows. There's always that one question. How does it smell? <laughs> The answers of which will put off many from growing bulba films because who wants a stench in their grow space if growing indoor or even a stench welcoming you when you first open your greenhouse if the bulbo is in bloom in the greenhouse. Yeah. <laughs> and warm temperatures add to that stench and there are no surprises as to why some bulbo films, while beautiful, will never make it into anyone's collection. For that reason, the care cards have a section that describes fragrances for each bulbo if a fragrance was detected. I have chosen many species of bulbos that have pleasant fragrances because the genus has a reputation preceding it that bulbos stink and stink badly. So while some of the species I have in the care cards do have some very undesirable fragrances, I have also documented the intensity of those. I hope that in doing this, whoever is looking for a bulbo can source a species with confidence that they will not be surprised by something that cannot be enjoyed close up. 
or alternatively if a species is picked because it happens to bloom the largest bloom of all bulbums is a sequential bloomer as well like the echinolabium at least everyone is fully aware of what they can expect and thus not be disappointed however if the care cards do not have any species that you would consider sourcing then in your research if you come across the terms attracts flies or pollinated by flies then those are the ones i would recommend you stay away from because think about it what else attracts flies where do you often see flies happily rummaging around and i do not mean buzz and scuzz and that is me making reference to my two favorite flies of all time from the movie raising stripes <laughs> if you have not seen that and want a good laugh that is what i'm talking about buzz and scuzz anyway so think where do we always see flies happily rummaging around flies are drawn to rotten meat of all types moist rubbish and anything that nature considers animal droppings i'm using kind language <laughs> If a bloom is capable of attracting flies, you are most certainly guaranteed to have researched a bulbo that has one of these fragrances and that is something to be mindful of. Besides that, when you look at images of the different bulbo blooms, you will recognize certain similarities to some of the above mentioned odors for lack of a better term the bloom structures, what they look like, the wartiness, gnarliness, the color, all speaks volumes as to what fragrance it could be. And if after all that you're still with me, thank you so much. If this has already been of help or encouraged you to get yourself some bulbos because they're not that difficult to grow after all, hit that like button. It would really help the video out and maybe that elusive algorithm will find my channel. Thank you so much because now I am moving to the four bulbos that I have and as mentioned at the beginning, I have an average of 30% humidity in my climate which makes no sense at all seeing as I was on and on and on about humidity and bulbos being a match made in heaven. Well... Here comes my setup to counteract the lack of humidity. All of my bulbos are in a self-watering or semi-hydro setup. This way they always have access to water and a little humid microclimate is created around the pot for the underside of the leaves to benefit from. While this is not ideal, it is working for these bulbos. On top of that, my surface media is even more water retentive because I have used Akadama for the most part in all the pots. While I have one bulbo with a creeping rhizome, that is my Elizabeth Ann Buckleberry, you can see that other bulbos are smaller and their growth habit is a little bit more compact because back in the day when I was building this collection, I was intent on focusing on bulbo films as my main genus for the orchids I wanted to grow because the general care is so much more evenly spread out the genus is ideal to have in numbers there's not much second guessing going on however having seen what difficulty i had with the one bulbo film that has a creeping rhizome i quickly came to the understanding that this is not something i can sustain and care for because of my low humidity but still wanting to grow bulbos, i moved to the compact miniature ones and they are doing great i have so much airflow but dry airflow. <laughs> the minis with the Akadama at the surface being consistently wet has given me a buffer against my dry airflow. With the exception of my Contortisepalum, all the bulbos have bloomed, and for now they seem to be doing great in their setup. The Plumatum is top dressed with some lava rock because it was loose in the pot. I placed it on the media and to keep it from jiggling around, I surrounded it with lava rock, being mindful that bulbo films have sensitive roots. It is not quite rooted in yet, but it is not loose anymore either, so theoretically I could remove the lava rock and just have the Akadam on the surface, as is the case with my Dissiflorum. But the lava rock also maintains the Akadama wet for longer, the evaporation is slower, so for now I think I'm just going to keep it this way. The Dissiflorum is such a compact grower, I do not want the new growth to rot out or not find their way to the surface because a piece of lava rock is in the way and blocking airflow. For that reason, I have mixed a little grit into the Akadama to break up the wetness of it, allowing airflow around all the tight bunched up structures and with that, the threat of rot is eliminated. 
Seeing as repotting Bulbophyllums is a little cumbersome because of the creeping rhizome and supports are not really ideal for this type of growth habit. And we want our orchids to look nice as well. Without having some wire grid that spoils the aesthetics, I pot mine up using wire that matches the strength of the rhizome in question, wrap one end of the wire around one end of the rhizome, and then create like a daisy chain along the length of the rhizome, much like you would train a branch on a bonsai tree, then place the longer ends of the wire into the pot, using those as my anchors while bending the rhizome as far as I can without snapping it. <laughs> in this way, I can at least position and secure the orchid in the pot until it has a chance to root in. With a bulbo that has a creeping rhizome, this will only help for a certain period of time as the orchid grows. The rhizome will do its thing and we're back off to being adventurous. And then we can see how we can get the newly growing rhizome back in the pot for as long as it is feasible. That's the only downside about bulbo films with a creeping rhizome in a pot if they are a larger bulbo film. The little minis, we can handle those. There's no issues with them. The bigger the bulbo, the longer the rhizome, the more woody the rhizome becomes before we can actually manipulate it without breaking it off. It's a game, it's a gamble. But thankfully, I'm able to keep mine somewhat happy even though my winter temperatures drop to 14 degrees Celsius. But apart from one, the Dissiflorum, the other three are showing signs of active growth. The Plumatum has a spike coming. There's a new growth on the Contortisepalum as well as the Elizabeth Ann buckleberry. The Dissiflorum is what you have seen in the footage throughout the video and that one bloomed a couple of months ago. So being a warm to hot grower, it will grind to a halt with any form of new growth until the temperatures warm up enough. As far as I'm concerned, I'm glad that it is still alive. Going through the second winter with me, being so small, it's doing great given the circumstances. When it comes to the amount of light I can give mine, currently they are not getting much because the sun is higher in the sky, so their positioning in the grow space is deep shade, which is not good enough to encourage blooming for my Elizabeth Ann, but the others seem to be doing okay with their light levels. Meanwhile, we shall see about the Contortisepalum because it took me a while to make it happy. I struggled with the balance of humidity and airflow for the longest time, and only in the past two years have I managed to leave it alone and settle into the pot. Time will tell. The new growth, though, is looking promising. I feel it can now just get its grow on and settle into the pot and maybe eventually bloom for us. That would be nice if I could increase the light levels. Hopefully around May, they will all be pushed up and then they can live on the glass shelf in the grow space right by the window. But you see, I have had two of my bulbo films from Jump. It'll go in my fifth year now and you can see how long it takes to tweak certain things to get things right. And with that, I'm really hoping that this video will give you a jump start, a head start to the game so that you don't have to go through the three years of dealing with what works, what can't work, everything I've tried to explain to you in this video. So I do really hope and keep my fingers crossed that I was successful in doing all of that and that you found this video useful. Once again, I welcome your questions and your own observations on this fabulous, wacky and wonderful genus in the comments. Should I have missed anything, please bring that to my attention and we can elaborate further in the comments as well. If you have made it to the end of the video, thank you. Thank you for liking it and thank you for subscribing to the channel. Your support is so appreciated. And if I dare ask for one more thing, then I would really appreciate it if you could share this video wherever you know orchid aficionados assemble and come together that would mean a lot to me despite certain circumstances with this video coming out the research was the longest i have ever had it was a wonderful journey into the world of bulba films and once again, even though I only have four, I do believe by now you throw a bulba film at me and ask me about it, and I'm going to be able to tell you all about it. <laughs> so thank you for giving this video all the exposure that I believe it deserves. Hoping you feel the same way, hoping that it has helped you misbehaves class and anybody else. There's a lot of hope in this video. <laughs> But I have one more thing left to say. <laughs> I know, not quite done yet. Still, you made it to this part of the video. Thank you. I get to wish you a beautiful day. On that one condition though, that you please stay safe. Take care, bye.